Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us tonight as we'll review the MIT's Global Climate Action Simulator. My name is Lisa Del Bono, and I am one of the Citizens Climate Lobby's state coordinators for Michigan, and I co-lead the CCL Health Action Team. You know, this is a really exciting time in Congress, and as someone who has been devoted to seeing meaningful comment, climate action for quite some time, it brings me great hope that Congress is ready to take action. I hope that we'll, we will see them utilize all the tools in the toolbox, including a price on carbon. So uh, what we'd like to do in the video today is review MIT's Global Climate Action Simulator. It is in particular a global simulator. I wanna emphasize that it's not specific to the US. It's a macroeconomic model, a systems dynamic model, if you will, that is calibrated and tested against a whole suite of climate models. So it's a very reliable resource. Um, when we read IPCC reports, intergovernmental panel reports, we know that they use three different scenarios, a high emission scenario, a middle of the road, emission scenario and a low emission scenario. So this modeling is actually using the middle of the road emission scenario. And even though it's not specific to the US, one can evaluate the relative effectiveness of the measures being simulated and how they work together uh, to reduce emissions. So what I'd like to do actually is go to the actual website. I'm gonna click right here and we're gonna take a look at it so you get a sense of how it works. Now, there are many, many charts that one can evaluate, but we're gonna focus on these two right here. On the left-hand side is our energy mix from 2000 to 2100. And on the right side is our net greenhouse gas emissions for over that same period of time. This is our average global temperature by the end of the century. Um, given that middle of the road scenario. Now the experts tell us we need to keep that number under 1.5 degrees C if we wish to avoid tipping points and the worst effects of uh, climate change. So let's look at uh, these levers below and get a sense of what of some different measures that we can take. We've heard a lot about the Trillion Trees Act, so let's model afforestation, a type of carbon removal. We know the trees sequester carbon, so this is basically just planting new forests and restoring old forests, and let's say we do it over 100% of the available land. What would happen to our emissions then? Well, it will come down a little bit. It takes a while for them to come down because trees take a while to grow. Uh, and we can lower our average global temperature by 0.1 degrees. So this is a great thing to do. Everybody loves trees, but it won't by itself be enough to get us where we need to go. Similarly, if we look at electrifying our transportation system, we know that the electrifying, that the electric uh, motor is much more efficient than an internal combustion engine. So it makes a lot of sense to electrify our transportation system to create the infrastructure and put in policies that, that uh, incentivize that change. So let's move that lever as far to the right as we can. We do see emissions come down uh, only by 0.1 degrees C. Again, it's a good thing to do, but if you do that in isolation, it's not enough to get us to where we need to go. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. I've taken a series of screenshot, sh screenshots that show a variety of different uh, scenarios, and I think it'll just save us time. So right now, all of our levers are at uh, zero and we can model a, a variety of different things. So let's go over to the left-hand side and look at energy supply. And let's start by trying to phase out coal to the, as great an extent as we can, move the lever, lever over to the left. We do see emissions come down and our average global temperature decreases by 0.2 degrees. Facing out coal is a really good thing to do for human health. It cleans up the air. It's definitely one step in the right direction. Let's do more with our energy mix. Let's see what else we can do. Let's try phasing out all of our fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, and uh, maximizing the use of our renewables. What happens then? Well, our emissions definitely come down, and we're, our average global temperature has come down 0.6 degrees. This is really a great combination of things. This is obviously uh, the first steps in transitioning to a low carbon economy. But the other things, some other things we might want to do is improve energy efficiency in our transportation and building sectors and electrifying. 
So when we are uh, fueling those electric motors with renewables, it will certainly decrease emissions. So let's, um, let's do that. What I want you to do is keep your eye on the left-hand side at our energy mix and see what happens as we improve energy efficiency and electrify. The, the amount of energy that we need comes down really substantially. So it's clear that this is really a good, these are great efforts to institute. Our emissions have come down significantly. Our average global temperature is down to 2.4 degrees C. This is a great suite of um, climate initiatives. Now, the way I've modeled this, it, it's likely that every one of these levers would require a separate law or a separate regulatory policy. And we know how long it takes to institute laws and policies, and time is just not something that we have. So is there a single policy that would catalyze this transition to a low carbon economy and create and actually achieve similar results? And the answer is yes. If you were to put a price on carbon, like the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividends Act, you would actually reduce emissions um, an equivalent amount, and our average global temperature increase would get down to 2.4 degrees, just with um, instituting uh, a carbon price like the Innovate, uh, Energy Innovation Act. So let's hit those three dots and and figure out exactly how we modeled um, the Energy Innovation, Innovation Act. What is it exactly? So we're looking at carbon pricing and with um, the Energy Innovation Act, the, the price on carbon actually starts relatively low. It starts at $15 per ton of CO2 or CO2 equivalent. It's actually on the fossil fuel companies. It's not on individuals and it's at its source when it comes out of the ground or into the country. And that's really important because then the impact will be economy wide. Uh, the farther upstream it is, the broader the impact it will be. The price again starts low at $15 per ton, but then it goes up very predictably and transparently between $10 and $15 every year until essentially you've transitioned to the low carbon economy. That's the whole point in putting a price on carbon. This fee on carbon as the Energy Innovation Act is set up is just gonna go up and up and up. Now, what about a clean electricity standard? Isn't that a single policy that would reduce emissions quickly? Well, we can model that. Notice how up here it's carbon pricing and electricity energy standards? Well, we can measure, we can actually model this clean electricity standard by moving the bar down and um, taking a look at that. So we've just moved the bar down and we're looking at 100% um, clean electricity standard. It starts in 2022 and achieves its goal by 2035. And what we see is that we do get significant emissions reduction and our average global temperature increases down to 3.2 degrees. So we're down 0.4 degrees C. So this is definitely also a good policy and effective policy. Um, but you need to remember that in comparison to a carbon price that has an economy-wide effect, this is sector specific and affects only the electricity sector. So that's about 27% of the US emissions. Now what I'd like to do is look at a different policy simulator. It's the energy policy simulator and it's specific to the United States. And in this modeling or in this chart, we've actually just at, looked at the electricity sector. We're looking at CO2 emissions and just of the electricity sector. And what would happen if we had did nothing? That's a black. The gold is a, a carbon tax similar to the Energy Innovation Act. And the gray is uh, models a 100% uh, clean electricity standard um, uh, that achieves this goal in 2035. So um, if we look at this a little more closely without the circles, what we see is that both policies would phase out coal. So that's a great thing. But um, the one that's a little more steep is the clean, is the, uh, carbon tax. And so the carbon tax will actually phase out coal uh, a little bit more quickly than a clean electricity standard, and the area under the curve is less. And that translates directly into human lives saved and health improved. According to the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy, uh, by 2030, the Energy Innovation Act would decrease SOX and mercury by 95% and NOx or nitrous oxide by 75%. And these are the building blocks of air pollution. So it cleans up the air very, very quickly.
And that translates into saving lives, improving health, and really saving hundreds of billions of U.S. healthcare dollars every year. Now, the clean electricity standard, again, also does phase out coal, but it does a little bit uh, less quickly. Uh, where it's really helpful is near the end of this graph, around a graph around 2035. See, so it has a pretty abrupt end and actually crosses under uh, the gold line. And in this area, um, because it mandates that all fossil fuels are out by 2035, it could be more effective at driving out emissions from natural gas that might be used to address intermittency issues in the grid. The price may not get that very last little bit out of it quite as quickly. So it really is a yes and both policies are good. So if we were to model that going back to MIT, the um, En-ROADS, if we were to model both of them, the Energy Innovation Act and the 100% clean electricity standard, we could get our emissions down to 2.3 degrees. Again, just the, the Energy Innovation Act was 2.4 degrees. But you know what? We got to get down to 1.5 degrees. So we need to, we still need to do more. And that's where that economy-wide carbon tax is so important. The Energy Innovation Act is so important because it decreases the demand of fossil fuels in all sectors of the economy, not just the electricity sector. And so it al aligns financial incentives with other policies that we will still need. And we sh I showed you earlier how important energy efficiency uh, and electrification of the transportation and building sectors are. So now the price, if we put both the price on carbon and institute those other um, initiatives, we actually can get down to 2.1 degrees C average global temperature increase. And remember, without a price on carbon, we were only at 2.4 degrees. With 100% clean electricity standard, you'd be at 2.2 degrees. So uh, the clean electricity standard and the price on carbon really amplify the effectiveness of energy efficiency and uh, electrification. It's a solutions multiplier. Now that economy-wide price would also then create an incentive on manufacturers or businesses to produce the same product or the same service with less fossil fuel energy. We know that fossil fuel companies are gonna pass the cost down to manufacturers and businesses. They're all gonna feel, feel that same cost increase. And so the one who can produce that same product uh, in a less energy intensive way Will actually create, will actually earn more profits. And people will, uh, businesses will get creative and they'll innovate. And I'm sure there will be many new technologies that will be developed, but some of them may actually cap capture carbon, like biochar or some other uh, mechanism. And we could reduce emissions down to 2.0 degrees C if we introduce a new technology like that. And then uh, this is not directly related to. Um, uh, Energy uh, Innovation Act or carbon tax, but we can choose to eat less meat, we can improve our agricultural techniques, regenerative agriculture tends to improve the quality of the soil, good quality soil captures more carbon, we could reduce other greenhouse gas emissions, and now we're down to 1.6 average uh, global temperature increase, and then we could restore our forests and plant new trees and green our living spaces, and definitely get under that 1.5 degrees C um, global temperature increase. So we can do this, but it's gonna require a comprehensive package of climate initiatives. It's really all the tools in the toolbox. I hope I've convinced you that price on carbon is essential because it is clearly the single most effective lever to reduce emissions. And it has this economy-wide impact um, that results in uh, creating a, an incentive to electrify our transportation and building sectors, improve energy efficiency, and spur innovation. It's really a solutions multiplier. It also cleans up the air, which translates into saving lives and improving health, particularly in frontline communities. So I'm really excited to see how you're going to put together this comprehensive package of climate initiatives. I hope it contains a price on carbon. It's what people want. It's what people need. It's important for human health. And thank you so much for your time and attention. Bye-bye.